Good morning. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I want everybody to take a deep breath and wiggle a little. All right. (laughs) I promise, we learned this at the Buddhist temple. We're going to do the spoken meditation together. The words are in your order of service. There's a little bit of instruction in there. Not a big deal, okay? Um, In Buddhist services, there is often a chanted meditation that you perform. There's sung meditation, chanted, silent. Um, So to honor that, We're going to speak together. Ready? Okay. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be whole. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at ease. May we be whole. And God said, love your enemy, and I obeyed him and loved myself. This statement, attributed to the poet and radical Khalil Gibran, bears the weight of a truth much heftier than a handful of everyday words rightly should. We find teachings and themes across cultures and traditions that call upon us to love one another. In some instances, we are called to relinquish self-love for unconditional compassion for all, or to love one another as we love ourselves. Today's meditation came from Buddhist teachings that encourage self-compassion as a step along the Eightfold Path towards enlightenment. And in today's sermon, I'm going to discuss the call to love as yourself and what that call implies about how we love ourselves 
and the impact it has upon how we love one another. Loving others is reflected in the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. These are just the first three principles, and each is a direct call to love others. In truth, all seven principles are about loving one another and the world in some way. In the English language, love is most often defined as romantic affection, poetic in nature. We have several different qualifiers for love, such as unconditional love, self-love, erotic love, and familial love. It should be noted that the kind of love that we are called to have towards others is unconditional in nature. It is God's love. It is the kind of love that values each human as a person and creates sacred community. The connotations of the word love are varied. In some instances, such as Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, love your fellow as yourself, love is about actions, extending understanding and forgiveness that one would normally extend towards oneself. There's also covenantal love, as in loyalty of action toward God and your commitment to the covenant of your community. It's easy to see that there is a paradox in commanding someone to love when we think of it as a feeling. But love is more than a feeling. Love is not a noun. It is at least a verb. Love is alive with action. It is something we do. Before we move on, I want to take a moment to talk about neighbors. When we say, love your neighbor as yourself, who exactly are we talking about? Who is my neighbor? When asked this question, Jesus responded with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Famed philosopher Soren Kierkegaard takes the parable a bit further. Mercy, it seems, is not enough. He says that a neighbor is one to whom we have a duty. Thus, as citizens of the world, members of a community, and participants in a faith organization, our neighbor is everyone, including our enemies, including ourselves. As Unitarian Universalists, we love our neighbors in varying ways. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person by our work with the Interfaith Council, working to ensure that no one in our community goes hungry. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations by standing on the side of love with our LGBTQ neighbors, fighting for all gender identities and sexual orientations. By being allies and accomplices with our black and brown neighbors and bearing witness to the injustices that still occur because of the color of a person's skin, I have no doubt that we love our neighbors, near and far. What I wonder, though, is whether we forget ourselves sometimes. The Gibran quote I opened with today is an allusion to the Gospel of Matthew, which references the Hebrew Bible and reiterates the call to love your neighbor from chapter 5 and clearly states, love your enemies. The Samaritan was the enemy of the Israelite he helped in the parable Jesus told. And thus we learn that our enemies are also our neighbors. We should love our enemies because we have a duty to our neighbors which means that we must treat our enemies with the same compassion we offer our neighbors. If we have a duty to all people, including enemies, we have a duty to ourselves. 
because we are sometimes our own enemies. We fall short of the call to love one another by our inability to love ourselves. It's easy to fall into what Dr. Tara Brock calls the trance of unworthiness because we live in a society that tells us it's good to be hard on yourself. Dr. Brock is a therapist and a Buddhist who wrote the book Radical Acceptance, Embracing Your Life with the Heart of a Buddha, which I know several of us have read. The trance of unworthiness is, in essence, the rut we dig ourselves into when we participate in negative self-talk. This kind of self-talk often sounds like the phrases, I can't do anything right, I'm so stupid, and I'm not good enough for this. It also sounds like these four tropes, filtering, described as tunnel vision and refusing to celebrate successes, Personalizing, by thinking everything is a personal attack. Catastrophizing, defined by automatically anticipating the worst. And polarizing, refusing to see a gray area. Everything is either perfect or a total failure. What each of these phrases means is I'm not worthy of love. I experienced a time of radical change in my life several years ago. I was suffering from physical and mental illness and had lost my hope. Between the daily struggle to get out of bed because I had no energy and the nightly struggle to fall asleep because I was so anxious, I decided that death would be preferable to the life I lived. I don't think I had ever loved myself. I engaged in each of the four tropes of negative thinking and often told myself that I was a failure and everything was ruined. I was hyper-focused on my mistakes and was undeserving of love. Because I told myself these things, they came true. What you tell yourself matters. If you think it, it becomes your reality. I can't remember a time when I didn't hate myself. When I wasn't uncomfortable in my young body, simply for having a body. I can't remember a time when I was kind to myself. I was vicious. I had a great difficulty forgiving myself for any mistake I made. Because that's what I had taught myself. That's what society taught me. I beat myself up for years. I truly was my own worst enemy. How could I, in this state, have loved my neighbor? I'll tell you how. I couldn't. Not in a healthy way, at least. I tried, though. I was eager to be loved and would offer love to others at the expense of my own self, my values, and the way that I wanted to be in the world. It was damaging to both me and the community. After many years of being my own worst enemy, I had had enough. I found a cognitive therapist who helped me understand that I was both worthy of love and capable of loving myself. I'm going to share the wisdom she gave me with you. She told me to change the narrative. That's it. The story we tell ourselves is so important. If your story is filled with anger, self-loathing, and fear, you won't be able to love anyone the way both you and they deserve. You have to change the narrative. I'm not saying it hasn't been hard. I'm not saying that I do not still struggle with mental illness and negative self-talk every day. It takes practice and so much work. But... I am loving myself. Neuroscience tells us that our brains produce stress and anxiety neurotransmitters and hormones when we see or hear a word like no. 
Numerous studies that had a lot of big words in them that I didn't understand show <laughs> that negative language induces these stress chemicals. I don't know what they're called. It's too many letters. And they're produced any time we have negative thoughts. Our brains are hardwired for survival, and our primal brains want us to fear potential dangers. So words like illness or death provoke stimulus in our thalamus and amygdala, meaning we react to negative thoughts in the same way that we react to real-world dangers. Unfortunately, this means that negativity perpetuates itself much more easily than positivity will. Because our brains tend towards the negative, we must be conscious in our efforts to change the narrative. The founders of positive psychology discovered that we need a minimum of three positive expressions for each negative one, and that to truly flourish, we need five. Facial expressions and body language also count as negative thoughts. So every time you shake your head or frown, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're releasing those toxic neurochemicals. I know folks who list at least five encouraging things about their day out loud to a partner or friend to promote thinking about their lives in a positive way. In religious education, we don't use shut up or stupid. By changing the narrative and taking steps to escape the trance of unworthiness, we are able to take control of the way we love ourselves and our neighbors. Take a moment and think about what it is that you are most passionate about in our world. Is it the fight for 15 because dignity is a living wage? Is it creating better gun control laws because more people have been shot by toddlers than terrorists this year in the United States? Is it the struggle against systemic racism because our justice system is violent towards our black and brown neighbors? Is it the development of acceptance for our neighbors of all faiths because tolerance is just not enough? Is it creating a safe community for youth and adults who identify as LGBTQ because Hate Bill 2 undermines equal treatment of all gender expressions and sexualities? Are you passionate about passing your love of sports on to another generation? Because teamwork, sportsmanship, triumph, and dealing with defeat are important. Or perhaps you want to change the world one smile at a time, offering kindness to everyone you meet. Maybe you just want to listen. Maybe you want to compost. Maybe you want to break bread. Whether it is for a small community or a large one, how is it that you want to love your neighbors? How is it that you want to love yourself? Remember, love is not just a feeling. Love is all the things we do to extend justice, equity, fairness, kindness, devotion, and compassion to our neighbors. The call to love your neighbor as yourself means that we must give ourselves all the same care, dignity, and honor that we would lend a neighbor. I am sure that we are committed to loving our neighbors. 
We work hard to make the world a better place every day. What I ask is that we make a conscious effort to extend this love towards ourselves. We do this by emphasizing the positive, using that three to one ratio every day. We do this by forgiving ourselves, even when the mistake seems catastrophic. We do this by taking care of our minds and bodies, even when we can do just one more thing on our to-do list. We do this by saying no sometimes, even when we want to say yes. Even when we are angry, tired, sad, hungry, it's raining, the coffee is cold, the car won't start, and the election is depressing. (laughs) Even, and especially when, it is difficult. We must answer the call to love our neighbors by first loving ourselves. Our sacred community is always glad to love us, especially in the times where we find it difficult to care for and love ourselves. That does not mean we can get by without loving ourselves. We do a disservice to our communities when we do not love ourselves. The research indicates that when we engage in that self-talk, that negativity, we set ourselves up for failure. When we enter community with this attitude, we can damage the community, even if that's not our intention. What are you passionate about changing in the world? When you think about how it is that you want to love the world, do not forget that you are a part of it. In order for us to do good works and make the world a less bigoted, less divided, and more equal place, a world that affirms and promotes the inherent worth and dignity of every person, we need to make sure that we are loving ourselves as well. And God said, love your enemies, and I obeyed him and love myself. Go and do likewise. Amen.